in California, we have a program, it's called Ag in the Classroom. It's kind of um, sponsored by the Farm Bureau. Uh, we have such an urban state that uh, the farm community felt that they needed to have some presence in the curriculum throughout the, all the public schools and other uh, parochial schools too in California. So the farmers volunteered to do uh, representative demonstrations for different things. Um, what Mike was talking about with the carbon and with the cotton with the t-shirt, I happen to grow cotton, so one of the crops. Um, a bowl of cotton takes 55 days to go from the time that it's a flower to the time that it opens up in the fiber that we use to make my shirt. And so to understand how carbon works in the plant and in one of the lessons in grammar school, it's about understanding how chlorophyll is made every day by the sunlight and a gaseous exchange goes on with CO2 from the air creating oxygen, all good things that we need in our environment. And in that process, that chlorophyll becomes a part of the carbon chain, right? It's at the beginning of the carbon. And it goes down to the roots, gets converted into sugars. Those sugars are transported back up. And in plant physiology, you talk about the fruiting point as being a sink. Think of it that way, huh? It's a repository of energy. So a potato is a sink of carbon, of sugar. What happens to it? It gets converted to something called starch. All starches is a multiple carbon chain. Well, cotton is made out of, it was referred to as cellulose, okay? And cellulose, hemicellulose, those are things that are very complex along carbon chains. So what happens in that bowl for 55 days, when you were a kid, I don't know if you ever made candles, but you took a little wick, right? You melted the paraffin and you dripped it over the wick. And over time, you did multiple passes as the, car, as the paraffin hardened, then you put another coat on it and pretty soon you had a candle. Then you could light it and you could demonstrate to the kids how it would pull the paraffin up. The cotton fiber is exactly the same thing. So you have a cotton seed. Off of the seed, the fiber grows inside the bowl. And every day, you lay sugar into that bowl. Being as it's sugar, we all know what sugar is. something the kids like to put on their cereal in the morning. It's sweet. Our tongue has a great propensity to get the flavor of sugar. It's sweetness, huh? We like that. So what you do is you take the cotton bowl when it's half growing, and you cut it in half, you squeeze the little juice because it's always full of juice, and you taste that. And it's usually mildly sweet. We always like concentrated sugar. We take sugar beets in the United States and in the southern part of the United States we use sugar cane, but what that is actually very concentrated daily accumulation of sunlight and CO2 as sugar. Okay, so we're all about carbon. Today in the greenhouse gas business, it's all about offsets for CO2 because we burn fossil fuels, create CO2, how is it that we're going to offload that if we're not going to off-balance the CO2 in our environment? Agriculture is one of the few places where you can harvest CO2 and store it and take it out of the atmosphere. And we store it as sugar, as carbon. It's all the good things that other people did a lot better job than I could of explaining yesterday, and it's really important that you understand those things. It isn't really what my talk was about, but being as we were talking about carbon, I thought that was a good example. And it's something that you can tell people so they have a clear idea how important carbon is. Um, another little lesson. Um, I was invited here because I have done a lot of work with salt. And so 
everybody thinks of salt as something that you might go to the store and buy, okay? This is salt. This is sodium chloride. Salt is a term in chemistry for things like sodium chloride. We have a lot of salts that we use every day. If you went to the store, you could buy a product called low sodium salt. What is low sodium salt? It's potassium chloride, okay? If you were uh, using fertilizer and buying a blended fertilizer, most of the time, potassium chloride is referred to as muriated potash. It's something that we actually mine out of the ground. But it's very water soluble, just like this salt, sodium chloride. The other thing that we have in our water is something called sodium sulfate. Okay, so there's different forms that it can come in. All of them have different water solubilities. Sometimes we use gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate helps to flocculate the soil, bring calcium to the soil. It's referred to as a neutral salt because it has a pH of about seven and it won't generally change the pH of the soil unless the soil is above 8.2 in pH. But it does bring health, it brings calcium to the soil. Very important. Besides carbon, calcium is a very important ingredient because the cell wall working on the osmotic transfer of water inside the system, these sugars I was talking about, need to have a good potassium, helps the water flow around in the plant. Calcium helps build good, healthy cell walls. If you don't have good balances of that, you can't ship your produce across the street. You gotta have good health for that plant so that it can bring all those different nutrients together and build things that make good structure in the plant so that it has the ability to get last for a few days before you eat it. But anyway, there's a lot of different salts. And we are about to harvest them. Why? Because this is something we need in our society. This is something that we need in our diet. Too much will kill you. Not enough will kill you. One of the items that people get confused about is another one of the elements on the periodic chart, right? Sodium's on the periodic chart, chlorides are, chlorine is, carbon is, nitrogen is, zinc is. And in the area of metals, there's one that's called selenium. Selenium, again, is a very necessary component of your diet. If you don't have selenium, you're gonna have big health problems. We've done a lot of work on the good side of selenium and we have some things I think that could be applicable here that would benefit. So there's probably half of the United States. My wife was a youth advisor for the extension service in Tulare County when I married her. So we believe green. <laughs> We're the 4-H people. And um, we have sheep. Sheep are a ruminant animal, and a good part of the forage that they eat in the United States is, is deficient in selenium. There are other areas, as here and where I live, that have excess. So again, you gotta balance that in the diet of ruminant animals. It's expressed in a deficiency as what they call white muscle disease. The little babies can't stand up and it's a deformity in the animal. Actually, you will actually have abortion in the animals or they won't have a successful even getting the uh, female pregnant if you don't have proper selenium levels in the mother. So, we've got to take the lemon and make lemonade out of it is what we're trying to do. That's what you're going to have to do here. So one of the problems that brought the issue to our doorstep was the water district that I live in was delivering water to a water, a big large reservoir that was shallow. And this was before the technology was available to assess 
the micro amount of material in the water known as selenium. It deformed the wildlife, primarily the migratory waterfowl. So it became a great whipping post for irrigated agriculture in the eyes of others and others made a lot and still are making a lot of mileage on that. All I can say is do what you can to be proactive and get on the right side of that curve because you won't believe how much it has cost us to overcome the negativity of that issue. Um, and so that you can conceptualize, kind of like the cotton bowl, the wick, and all that, it takes two parts per billion of selenium in water to affect the eggs of migratory waterfowl. The Fish and Wildlife Service is ultra sensitive to this issue. To visualize that, we were talking, Rudy was talking yesterday about soil, okay? So does anybody remember, this is part of the poster deal here, does anybody remember how many pounds of soil there is in an acre foot? One foot deep, 43,560 uh, square feet, huh? One acre. How much does that weigh in pounds? Anybody? How many pounds does the soil weigh in an acre foot? It's four million pounds. Okay? Four million pounds. How many pounds does an acre foot, we talk about irrigating, we talk about how much water we apply to the land, we apply increments of inches, we talk about evapotranspiration rate. In our particular area, in the summertime, we evaporate approximately 3,500 or about a third of an inch of water through the plant every day. So if you don't have something greater than 50% of field capacity, in other words, the soil isn't wet for 50% of that value, then you're gonna have, a, well, our soil, our, we have clay loam soil, we hold about two inches of water per foot. What that means is, in that foot of soil, we depleted 50%, we have an inch of water available, that foot of soil will last three days. We figure in our soils, we have a rooting depth of about three feet. So somehow that plant has to get that much water, okay? In an acre foot of water, there is 2.7 million pounds, okay? So to visualize what two parts per million are, okay? If we have four million pounds and it's a billion pounds, you divide four into 10, you get 250 acres. Some of you probably have a field that may be 300 acres, 250 acres of land, right? Think about a land leveling person coming and cutting how many yards you would have to do, how big a pile that would be, 250 acre feet of dirt. It would be huge, right? That would be one billion pounds. In water, you get an allotment for your land, and whatever that is, if it's two acre feet, then you would have 370 acre feet of water, or what in essence would be about 170 acres of land that you irrigate with two acre feet would be a billion. This is two pounds, folks. Can you imagine this two pounds on 250 acres, how much that isn't. That's how significant the element selenium is. And that's a real deal because they've done a ton of research at our expense 
to figure that out. And they verified that multiple times. I handed out this paper, and I kind of wanted to go through it. You kind of feel like you've probably gone to school with John, but it's the way it is. I guess I have a bit of a school teacher attitude towards this deal because I want people to understand what it is I'm trying to communicate. And if you have any questions, this is like school too, you can raise your hand, we'll, we'll talk about it. I may not always be right, but I'm in the right direction, you know? So if you get these papers, I'm gonna make reference to some of the paragraphs. In California, the Water District Association contributed money to a foundation. In the water, it's called the Water Education Foundation. We're in agriculture. We're the water users. We use, in California, we have 28 million acre feet of water developed out of 70 million acre feet that falls on the state in a year. Out of the 28 million, agriculture uses 40%. 40% of the developed water is dedicated to the environmental remediation of the effect of the development of that water. That's a very complicated thing. You can ask me later about that. I can explain how that works. But they have first demand on any of the water. And then there's 20% left, and that is for municipal uses. In agriculture, we use a fair amount of water. It's the lifeblood of what we do in an arid climate. The reality is, is we don't have many votes. You all know what that means because you're here and you have referenced the Denver situation and all that and so everybody worries about the effect of what the urban situation might have. So what we did as a water user community is to found, bring a foundation together in Sacramento. If you look on the back, last paragraph of this, Rita is the lady that takes care of this for us. They're putting on a tour. The primary purpose of this is to take legislative people, both assembly people and their staff, as well as people from key control agencies on tours and we tour them around and we explain our story and if people will talk to us and if we can explain why we're there the benefit we have for the society they get it there are a lot of people that don't want to go on the tour because they want what we have, which is the water. And I often tell people, I said, I feel like a, a thief. I feel like I take the water and steal it. You know, what am I doing with the water? I'm growing stuff. I mean, I grow more than I can eat. So somebody else gets something to eat, you know? And I think that's pretty cool, you know? The beauty of our system, as we all know, is the fact that I provide enough food as a farmer in the United States for about 400 people. Think if you were in Africa, you know you've got 80% of the population groveling for their food and they're all starving. We give people the privilege as farmers, we give the people the privilege. We have something really to tell the world. We give them the privilege of not having to grovel for their food every day. We have the ability to make it possible for further intellectual development within the society. You don't put people on the moon if you don't have the engineers 
You don't have the engineers if you don't have the education. You don't have the education because if everyone's out working on the farm trying to get the food together, how are you going to teach the people to do all that stuff? So it, it's a very clear chain. It's a great story to tell. That's what we do with this Ag Water Education Foundation, the necessity that we are not stealing the water from the world, destroying the environment. My uncle came in 27, my dad actually came in 37. And the soil is better today than when they came. A lot of the conventional speak in the day is how we're destroying things. If we destroy things, how is it that we're yielding more when we do the soil fertility analysis on our soil? It's better today than it was 20 years ago. Obviously, we've been educated. We work to do good things for the soil because it's what takes care of us. It's kind of like owning the animals. If you don't take care of the animals, you're not going to do very well, right? You take care of those animals, they're going to produce for you, you're going to be okay. So let's look at this situation that the seven western states are involved in. This report just got published. There, as you well know, is huge pressure on the Colorado River system. In the third paragraph, the Colorado River Basin Water Study supplants projects range projects a range of future water supply and demand imbalances. We talked about a little bit about that yesterday. The median water supply projections to the median water demand projections, the future water supply and demand imbalance is projected to be 3.2 million acre feet of water by 2060. The number rose to as much as 7.7 .7 million acre feet, comparing the water supply projections based on the greatest water demand projections. So the one issue is things kind of going along as they are, but unless we get our arms around immigration, all these other social issues, the influx of population growth, demand, it's going to be more like the 7.7 .7 if you project it ahead as it has for the last 50 years. Down in paragraph number five, Carly Gerla, water resource engineer for reclamation, co-manager of the study, said the examination of the entire basin has generated intense interest and scrutiny that's us folks, regarding its findings and what it presents as options and strategies for future management before the study could contemplate the tools for going forward it had to depict an accurate picture of the challenge facing the seven western states. That's the good news because we have something to talk about in Delta and Montrose in the associated Gunnison River drainage. You turn the page, you can read the rest of the story, uh, the rest of the article later. On the second paragraph, Column, who's uh, said the study confirms Colorado River water managers have long understood the over allocation of the Colorado River system coupled with increasing water needs and the potential for reduced supplies due to climate change will put the communities resources relying on the river at significant risk of prolonged shortages in the future. Skipping down two more paragraphs, Pitt said it's possible for water users needs to be met without constructing large infrastructural projects. What we have in an approach that in realize first and foremost on water con 